Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Welcome to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa. We're the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend Radio and TV Magazine, as well as Parks and Travel Magazine. And joining us on today's show, we have acclaimed novelist Mike Nemeth, and he's going to tell us all about his brand new crime thriller. It's called The Undiscovered Country, and it's a follow-up to his best-selling debut novel, Defiled. Same mm-hmm. character in there. So he goes from Defiled to The Undiscovered Country, and uh, it's published by Morgan James Fiction, and uh, The Undiscovered Country is out on May 15th, 2018. And it really explores the complexities of families, the depths of secrets they hide, and the sacrifices they make to keep them buried. In fact, Kirkus Reviews is calling it a precise, elaborate tale that shows just how menacing a family's history can be. We all have those little skeletons in the closet, and that's why we have Halloween. But anyway, uh, go to Mike's <laughs> website. It's MikeNemusAuthor.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Nemo's novels.com welcome mike how are you (laughs) i'm wonderful lisa thank you very much and happy early mother's day nancy thank you (laughs) you know mike you know these skeletons in the closet we we don't need to wait for halloween really because we have authors like you who decide hey i want to expose these early (laughs) uh tell us a little bit because i know defiled um really has the same character randall marks tell us about Randall Marks, and then let's get into his family gossip. <laughs> the family is really good gossip. Sure, sure. Uh, Randall is uh, an anti-hero, uh, so that's a person who sort of instinctively questions authority and challenges the status quo. He doesn't accept uh, the truth for uh, on its face. He needs to be sure that what he's hearing, what he's believing in, is absolutely the truth. So in Defiled, uh, he ran into trouble with the law and uh, uh, he struggled against the legal system and uh, the state of our mental health care. And that's a standalone book. So so The Undiscovered Country is just a new set of challenges for Randall. His mother becomes critically ill, uh, surprisingly, uh, and all of a sudden, the children gather at her bedside because doctors don't expect her to survive. But of course, Randall doesn't take any of that at face value. He fights against the doctors uh, to keep her alive, to do things uh, medically that they don't advise him to do. And, and he discovers along the way that her condition may not be an act of God. And as he, as he delves further into that scenario, he uncovers secrets about his two siblings who don't particularly care for him, uh, irregularities with his mother's uh, estate, uh, and then a, a scheme to embezzle money from a wealthy person who claims to actually be his birth father. Well, you know, why don't you just put everything <laughs> in a book? I mean, that's a good that's a good pile of, you know, family drama and gossip. Scandal. Yeah, I mean, do you this should be a movie. Like, do you, would you ever want this to be a series? Because, you know, I think that all of us have some part that we can identify with, with what happens in families. And um, I know for our side, definitely, uh, we, we've had our, our fair share of family drama and uh, secrets. And, and then somebody, somebody will let something out and then it just explodes, you know. Um, but don't you think this would be a good, like, TV series or movie? You know, what's interesting about that comment is my writing style is uh, one where it, it's it's light on narrative and very heavy on dialogue and action. So it reads, these are, these are fairly hefty books, but it reads very, very easily and quickly because everything is the characters uh, taking actions or the characters speaking. Uh, and that's how we that's how we hear the story, or that's how we read the story, which is very much, of course, like a movie script, right? You don't authors don't have narrative typically in a movie script. Uh, it's all about what you can see and what you can hear in the dialogue, and that that's actually the way I write. So it would be pretty easy to adapt. 
well, you could just hire my family, and, and there's your play right there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was going to say, Nancy, you kept running out, because Nancy read the book yeah. she's just recently finished, and she's like, it's really good. And then this happened, and, and then, then that happened. I'm, I'm like, like, would you stop? I mean, but we do this to each other whenever yeah. we get into a good book, and then we have to each give each other like six months before we can read the book, because we keep nagging when it's good. But you kept running out like, hey, now – this happened. You're not going to believe what happened next. I know. It's, it's really got a lot of twists to it, which I like because, you know, we, we read a lot of books here. And sometimes, you know, you by the fourth page or so, you know what's going to happen. You know who the murderer is and and you already know. And that kind of ruins it for me. I like it when I don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, look at that. Ooh, that's a twist. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's difficult for authors uh, to have a clear view of as they're writing is uh, does the book have enough of that kind of thing in it is there enough suspense is there an, are there enough twists are the are the good characters good enough to identify with are the bad characters bad enough uh to to want them to get their comeuppance uh, it, it's a matter of uh, of degree, really, and uh, and and that's actually a really difficult thing to get right. The balance uh, back and forth to get right. Uh, so I'm really pleased to hear you say that. No, I like it because it, to me it's very human. Mm -hmm. Because I can actually I can see these people. I I already know who they are, you know, and and I like that in a book where th this is a real person. Even do they do they do crazy stuff. It's a real person, and so it, it, you can identify with it. So, you know, and it does read very quickly, which is nice. Yeah, there's a there's a tagline. It was on the first book, Defiled, but it applies here as well. Uh, and it goes something like, uh, "There are no evil people. There are only evil acts committed by ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances." Ooh, I like that. that. That's so true. I yeah. Mean, you know, because when you look at what happens in, in life, I mean, there's so many, there's just such juicy stories out there, like what, <laughs> what you've got going on here. You know, I, I wonder about, you've got the character development and I want to talk about your characters where, where, you know, do you watch, do you do people watching a lot? But I know that you've got a background in basketball and, um, you know, looking at that, uh, being a, a, a former basketball coach. And um, when you think about, basketball or sport especially in the coach looking at the different games and I know nothing about basketball so just just to tell you that right now but um I know the ball goes up and down and you're supposed to bounce it <laughs> so that's cool and and there's really tall dudes playing it but anyway yeah. so it's fun to watch <laughs> uh, but but you've got to know like you have to it's like playing chess there's tactics and um, moves and if you do this move this can happen so did you find those skills of being in the world of basketball help you in the world of writing about crime and, you know, all these twists and turns of that kind of thinking? I, I, you know, that's, that's really insightful. Uh, when I was a basketball coach, I won games just about every way possible, and I lost games just about every way possible, games you thought were going to go into your win column and all of a sudden there's a twist and something goes wrong and somebody didn't do something right and you walk away a loser uh, and life is like that right it's very precarious uh, and the decisions we make uh, at the last moment can really change the outcome of, of something you thought you had uh, well under control yeah that little ripple effect yep you know, it's the what could go wrong theory. It's the what could go wrong. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side um, was a he was a butcher for Hollywood stars, and he had a really nice, expensive home up in Hollywood Hills. And um, I don't know what happened to him. One day, the police called my dad and said my grandfather was dead, and that he was found on some street in L.A. with his chest burned. And nobody's ever done anything about that ever. That was that, you know, there was, it's like, how did you, what happened? You know, nobody really investigated, you know, which I would consider that a murder, but apparently, you know, so we've got this nice big mystery in our family and, and it, it gets better from there. So I, when I read this book, I was like, 
hmm, yeah. you know, because there was there was money, but um, that's interesting too. Yeah, you know, it, it it really was interesting. There was money at one time, but I don't know where that went either. <laughs> but isn't that the thing? That's the key. Is it? There's always money or someone mm-hmm. being, you know, born you know, and it, with a different person than everybody thought. It's always about, you know, who is the mother or the father, especially who's the father and where's the money. Those are the two things in, mm-hmm. in most scandals, right? Yeah. Uh, correct, correct. And I, I don't want to give too much away about the undiscovered country, but in the end, as Randall is trying to figure out uh, who's embezzling money and, and whose father really is, he actually solves a murder no one knew had been committed. And Nancy, that sounds exactly like your circumstance. <laughs> it's really interesting. And I keep thinking I want to go back and, you know, investigate some things. But um, on the other hand, sometimes it's better not to, you know. Yes, read, read your books instead. <laughs> well, this is interesting because it goes with, you know, people making up stories and lies. And mm. from our experience with our family, we watched, even my grandmother, basically cover up things and bold face lie yes. to everybody but she started to truly believe her lies yes. and we were talking about we've talked about this with other friends and you know just there was this generation we thought is it a generational thing where society you know you're not going to say what the truth because society's la di da you're not supposed to do that and I, I just wonder if it's a generation then I think maybe it is regional or it's just the way people are because I know that you know Randall's uh, out in it's, uh, Augusta, Georgia, and the South, there's this, and we used to live out in the Panhandle in Florida so, and travel around those areas, and I love, love, love the South. But there's also this, um, you, you need to shush. You don't, you don't air your dirty laundry out. No one should know. There's a very, there's a, there's a, mis, there's a mysticism in the, up the South, and I, it's, I love it. And I think that's an interesting thing. I know you're based in Atlanta, but... I feel like the secrecy kind of goes with society. <laughs> well, well, it I'm does. I'm going to say that uh, very politely because I, I love the South and I love the, the Southern people. So please, no one take that wrong. No, no. But in the South, uh, there's uh, definitely this sense of propriety that you have to maintain, right, within your family. So when there are improper uh, things going on or or people who are an embarrassment or whatever, there's a concerted effort. Uh, and it's almost like an unspoken conspiracy. Uh, you know, people don't sit around the kitchen table saying, you know, we're never going to talk about Uncle Joe. They just don't. It, it's like inbred into the culture of the South. Wow. That's exactly it. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, it's, I like the the dialogue in your book because this reminds me of of times when our family would get together and there was always some explosion somewhere mm. <laughs> between the people we and it just got to only getting together on Christmas or Easter and you know we'd see each other like once or twice a year and that was that and there it would start out fun and people catching up and then by the end of the day or the evening Somebody would have a fight with somebody and everybody would get involved. It was just like watching Jerry Springer. (laughs) Okay, Jerry Springer is a little extreme, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And then there's uh, an aspect of sibling rivalry here. Uh, The three siblings, uh, Randall, his brother, and his younger sister, uh, have been conducting a sibling rivalry since they were children, of course, who were the favored kids, who were who were the uh, kids who were not favored, uh, whether it was by mother or by father, uh, and how have these kids done during the course of their lives? So we hear them bickering about, uh, I know, I know you haven't done very well at this, or I know you're just doing that. Uh, and and uh, in the event of the matriarch's illness, all of those all of those old feelings just come right to the surface and uh, sort of help us to understand who these characters really are. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. It is fun. What what led you to start writing novels? I I had. Um, done a lot of well as as a very young man I tried to write a novel and found I just didn't know enough about life and I collected a whole file full of rejection slips 
Uh, and, and then, of course, I went about normal life. I had a business career, but I, I did a lot of writing in my business career. And, and I always felt like uh, I, I, I had things to say. So I wrote, I wrote two nonfiction books and just found writing nonfiction is, is really hard work. I, I, I really admire people like Michael Lewis and uh, so forth. Uh, they, they do really hard work. Uh, and so in 2013, I, I was nearing the end of my uh, business career and, and just sort of on a lark, I thought, you know, I could, I could say the things I want to say through characters uh, by writing a novel uh, and I should just give it a try. So I, so I did and, and it worked and it was uh, a lot more enjoyable to do it that way. So I, I, I still write for the same reasons that nonfiction writers write, which, which is to make some point or, or bring awareness to an issue, uh, make people uh, understand better uh, some facet of our civilization. But I, but I do it through characters, uh, and, and that's just a whole lot more fun for me. And I think it's more fun for the reader as well. Uh, it's less onerous to uh, watch these characters go through this than it is to have somebody preaching to them in a nonfiction book. I agree. The, the preaching thing needs to stop. Uh, people are like, <laughs> that's, that's my preaching for the day. That'll be enough of that. Because if, when you're telling people what to do, I think they're tired of it. Like they, We've had people tell us what to do our whole lives. And it's, the way you connect is through stories. Uh, any kind of lesson, if it's coming through a story, is, um, is amazing. You know, to me, it's, it's, you, you connect and characters connect and even the villains people love the villains because you're like how did you know how did he or she think of this you know how did they cook that up and <laughs> there's some kind of you know weird ad admiration we have for the villains well look at J.R. Ewing you know yeah in Dallas everybody loves that dude <laughs> I know absolutely yeah you know so it's, it's interesting about the characters so for you know Randall who inspired Randall? Is it is it completely like I'm concocting this out of nowhere, or did you, you know, is it a do yeah, you know patchwork of people, or do you know this person? Uh, yesterday, I I was at a book club, and and somebody, you know, it's written in first person, and somebody said, "Are you Randall?" <laughs> and I said, "No, but I might actually like to be Randall." Uh, uh, characters uh, are are typically composites, right? Uh, we take a little bit of this person and a little bit of that person and a little bit of the next person, but the characters all have to interact properly in the story. So the characters have to have backstories, histories, uh, uh, character flaws, and character traits that make them that make their actions in the book believable. They have to be properly motivated to take the steps they take, whether they're, they're the good steps or the bad steps. Uh, so, so, so characters almost get built backward uh, in order to fit into the story, in order to fit into the plot, in, in order to do the things you want them to do. They have to be certain kinds of people. Uh, and so you create them out of the, the raw material that uh, you see in your friends, your relatives, your your business colleagues, and so forth, and put them together bit by bit, so so that they can play the role they're supposed to play in your in your story. Mm. But do you start with the plot first? I I I, I start with the themes first. So for Defiled, uh, one theme was uh, that justice under the law isn't always fair. There's a difference between fairness and justice. And, and we don't tend to recognize that until we actually get caught up in the legal system, which Randall does. Uh, and the other theme was about mental health. Uh, we, we really have a mental health problem in America uh, that causes a lot of our criminal behavior problems. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to highlight those two issues. And then the second step, would be a plot. And the, the same thing happened with the undiscovered country. Uh, I found through uh, the passing of my own parents that uh, aging and dying in America today, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult to do it with dignity. Uh, and I think the aging, uh, as, they, as they come close to that time, 
want nothing more than their dignity. And we, we actually take their dignity away in a whole bunch of ways, whether it's the kind of medical care we give them or how we warehouse them in senior homes at the end and hope they're not a bother to us or, or how we fight over their estates and over the future of the family after they're going to be gone. Uh, so I wanted to highlight those, uh, those themes. And, and then I, I build a story that will uh, allow the characters to take us through those situations. Uh, so, so the plot sort of comes second, if you will. And, and, then, and then you have to fit the characters into that storyline uh, and uh, in order for them to be believable. Uh, for me, that's the process that works. Other people might start at the opposite end and start with their characters. Interesting. Now, when you think about the characters, I want you to set the table. So I, you're going to have a dinner party. You're going to invite three of your characters over, and it could be from both books. Uh -oh. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's, it's defiled or you know the undiscovered country. So uh, three characters. You're going to invite them over for dinner, and we want to know who and why, because you're going to obviously there's going to be a discussion. There's going to be you know dinner conversation. So who and why, and and of course we want to know what's for dinner. <laughs> You're in the South. Uh, I know you have good food. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I certainly want Randall there because uh, Randall is, is going to challenge everything else, uh, everything that everybody else believes or says, and, and that's going to keep the, uh, the conversation uh, jumping uh, for sure. I, I, if I were to go back to uh, Defiled, there's a, there's a character uh, called Connie. Uh, and 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 she's disguised as sort of a uh, a minor character, uh, and we don't find out until the very end that she's actually the sociopath. Uh, and and sociopathic personalities are are fascinating in the same way that Ted Bundy is fascinating, right? Uh, and, and so she's sort of the behind the scenes sociopath, and. Uh, Randall would like to have a discussion with her. And, and then it, from the undiscovered country, uh, there's a, a heart surgeon uh, named Dr. Metzger. Uh, and I don't want to give too much away here either, but I think he's, he's an arch, archetype uh, medical practitioner today given the technologies that we have available to us uh, and uh, given our cultural attitudes toward uh, aging uh, and, and uh, becoming critically ill at the end and what happens to us. And so I'd really like to hear uh, what Dr. Metzger uh, has to say, I think. Um, so, so with those, with those three characters, uh, Metzger, Connie, and Randall, <laughs> that's a party this is going to be a lively one I, you know everyone's going to be sussing each other out you know but but of course we'd have to have uh southern fried chicken black eyed peas and collard greens okay All right. that's good that's good you got to have that so you know the one thing i wanted to touch on when you talk about this connie with the you know she's a sociopath and it's it's really interesting to me because we have some killer women criminals in the world. Like, I mean, obviously that's an interesting word to say, killer women, but really women, when it, you know, psychopaths and just that, that plotting and the hiding and scheming, the multitasking of crime, right? And women do it very, very well. And, you know, we just don't hear about them as often. And I think that's another thing that you're bringing to light is like, we know how to scheme. I mean, some of the best criminals are women. And even like Women History Month and everything, I always go, well, what about this, you know, this woman over here, she did this, you know, and, and then people are like, no, you, you don't want to, you know, showcase the criminals. I'm like, I do. It just shows how their brains, you know, they, if they were running a business, they would be, you know, really, really rich. <laughs> it's a pity they went on the other side. But I think that's fascinating that you're highlighting women in this too. There, there are uh, important female characters throughout both books. Uh, one character who uh, appears in both books is Randall's ex-wife, Carrie. Uh, and Carrie is a, is a psychopath. Uh, 
And we, we tend to interchange the term psychopath and sociopath, but, but they actually behave, they both have the same illness, mental illness, but they actually behave a little bit differently. Uh, and so Carrie is a psychopath and she's impulsive, quick to answer, uh, quick to temper, uh, uh, violent, uh, but all sort of in the moment. Uh, she has no conscience. Uh, so, so she's, uh, you know, able, uh, unable to control her impulses. Whereas, whereas Connie is the sociopath and sociopaths are what cops call organized criminals. They, they plot, they plan, they scheme, they stay under the radar, and, and they're in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, they're a lot more dangerous than psychopaths. Wow, see? Here we go. <laughs> I like this. I like this a lot. So did you do a lot of studying of this? You know, when you were writing, did you get into, you know, crime and, and how, you know, sociopaths and psychopaths think? I mean, did you do read journals or, you know, what did you do for, you know, for the knowledge of that? Yes, I no, I absolutely did. I, I, I bought books. I read books on mental health. I read books on uh, the five uh, personality disorders uh, and, and uh, consulted uh, psychiatrists. Uh, so that I, I used the right terminology and, and actually understood what I was trying to say. And the same thing from, from the uh, legal perspective. Uh, I had to research wills in South Carolina uh, and the different kinds of wills. So there, are, there are actually different kinds of wills, uh, holographic wills and, and legal wills and so forth, and what gets recognized and what doesn't. And when can a will be thrown out or dismissed and, and, you know, what constitutes a valid will? So, so yes, uh, there, there actually are uh, periods of time when uh, that's what you're doing when you're writing. You're, you're actually researching. Uh, so, so, so it's a lot of different kinds of work that you actually go through in order to publish a book. And then, and then when you're done and, and it's uh, available in the marketplace, uh, you get to meet wonderful people like Lisa and Nancy. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure meeting you. <laughs> it's been fun. It's a fun conversation, and I can't wait to delve into your book. Um, I have to wait for my mind to clear since Nancy did one spoiler after the other. But it's, I, but it's, it's, made, it's made good happy hour conversation, you know, <laughs> her reports on your book. So it's, it's awesome. Um, before you go, I also wanted to mention that you also have another book out. Um, it's nonfiction, right? 128 billion to one. Yes, that's a, a book about the NCAA basketball tournament, college basketball, okay. uh, and and why you can never win your your NCAA tournament uh, basketball pool, why you always pick the wrong teams. Uh, so it, it 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 gets into the statistics behind the game and also. Uh, how that tournament is actually constructed and what the barriers are to doing well in your office pool. It's a, wow. it's a short, fun little read. Uh, and uh, uh, it is available now uh, on all the online bookstores and hopefully in a few uh, bricks and mortar stores as well. Yeah, we got to keep those brick and mortar stores going. We certainly do. All yeah. those independent bookstores have to, you know, I gotta keep them stores. going. Bookstores are the best, you know, yeah. they really are. And it's just yeah, you know, we gotta we gotta support those. So everyone again, you can go to Mike Nemeth Author dot com. He's on Twitter as well at uh, under Nemo's novels. And also of course go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all those great places to get the undiscovered country out May fifteenth, two thousand eighteen. Again by Mike Nemeth. We wanna thank you, Mike, and thank you to our listeners always for joining us here on Big Blend Radio. We air on Monday through Thursday at four PM Pacific time, seven PM Eastern time. Fridays and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you go to BigBlendRadio.com, you'll see our schedule, and you can click through to listen uh, to the shows as they air live, or you can listen on demand through all those different networks we're on, like Spreaker, Blog Talk, SoundCloud, YouTube, you name it. It's all listed there. And also, don't forget, if you love author interviews and new books, go to BlendRadioAndTV.com. We feature a lot of author interviews in our Big Blend Radio and TV magazine, as well as our books department. So check that out there. But thanks so much, Mike. It's always a pleasure to chat with good authors like you. Well, thanks to both of you. And like you said, uh, thanks also to the listeners. 
Absolutely. And uh, we're going to close with some music. We always like to do some music. And uh, I picked this song for you because it's called Beautiful Bouquet. It is uh, from John Roniger. He is out of New Orleans, but I know he tours around and goes to Florida, Georgia, uh, all over the place. And uh, this is John Roniger and the Good for Nothing Band. And a beautiful bouquet is really about the beautiful bouquet of people we have in our life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the made many shades of psychopaths uh, or not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you can go to johnronegermusic.com. That's John with no H. Uh, and it's off of his album, Gypsyland, live at the Mint. So here it is. Beautiful bouquet. Take care, everybody. One, two, one, two, three, four. The world is full of derelicts and debutants, yeah, fools and savants, religioso prostatizes immigrants, indigents and uh, gypsy grifters, we got bums, we got drifters, hypocrites, wealthy misers, and oh, it's a beautiful bouquet of this thing called life. Oh, hey, what is life anyway? Ain't nothing but a beautiful bouquet. Uh oh, yeah, it's a beautiful bouquet. Ah, keep it tight, fellas. Mama, Mama, Lester, in ministers, fat. Tycoons, we got thugs, yeah, we got loons. Psychiatric analyzers, waitresses, garbage men and uh, undertakers. Men and I say we got quakers, hooters, girls, candy stripers. And oh, it's a beautiful bouquet of this thing called life. Hey, what is life anyway? Nothing but beautiful bouquet. Hey, it's a beautiful bouquet. I'm eating Slim Jims, drinking my Yoo-Hoo. Watching life go by from my front stoop. There, see a little bit of everything, a whole lot of what not. Boiling up in this big old crock pot. Thank you.